Good evening and welcome to Evening Prayer for Monday, July 27th. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let my prayer rise up before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. Joyous light of glory of the immortal Father, heavenly, holy, blessed Jesus Christ, we have come to the setting of the sun and we look to the evening light. We sing to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. You are worthy of being praised with pure voices forever. O Son of God, O giver of life, the universe proclaims your glory. The Lord Almighty grant us a quiet night and peace at the last. Amen. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praise to your name, O Most High, to herald your love in the morning, your truth at the close of the day. Praise to you, O Christ. O come, let us worship him. Lord Jesus, stay with us, for the evening is at hand and the day is past. Be our constant companion on the way. Kindle our hearts and awaken hope among us, that we may recognize you as you are revealed in the scriptures and in the breaking of the bread. Grant this for your name's sake. Amen. Deal bountifully with your servant, that I may live and keep your word. Open my eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. I am a sojourner on the earth. Hide not your commandments from me. My soul is consumed with longing for your rules at all times. You rebuke the insolent, accursed ones who wander from your commandments. Take away from me scorn and contempt, for I have kept your testimonies. Even though princes sit plotting against me, your servant will meditate on your statutes. Your testimonies are my delight. They are my counselor. Our New Testament reading today is from the book of Acts, chapters 22 and 23. But on the next day, desiring to know the real reason why he was being accused by the Jews, he unbound him and commanded the chief priests and all the council to meet, and he brought Paul down and set him before them. And looking intently at the council, Paul said, Brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day, and the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law, and yet contrary to the law you order me to be struck? Those who stood by said, Would you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest, for it is written, You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Now when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. It is with respect to the hope that and the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. Then a great clamor arose, and some of the scribes of the Pharisees' party stood up and contended sharply, We find nothing wrong in this man. What if a spirit or an angel spoke to him? And when the dissension became violent, the tribune, afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him away from among them by force and bring him into the barracks. The following night the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. Our Book of Concord reading today is from the Augsburg Confession, Article 20, on Good Works. Our teachers are falsely accused of forbidding good works. Their published writings on the Ten Commandments and other similar writings bear witness that they have usefully taught about all estates and duties of life. They have taught well what is pleasing to God in every station and vocation in life. Before now, preachers taught very little about those things. They encouraged only childish and needless works, such as particular holy days, particular fasts, brotherhoods, pilgrimages, services in honor of the saints, the use of rosaries, monasticism, and such things. Since our adversaries have been admonished about these things, 
they are now unlearning them. They do not preach these unhelpful works as much as they used to. In the past, there was only stunning silence about faith, but now they are beginning to mention it. They do not teach that we are justified only by works. They join faith and works together, and say that we are justified by faith and works. This teaching is more tolerable than the for former one. It can offer more consolation than their old teaching. The doctrine about faith, which ought to be the chief doctrine in the church, has remained unknown for so long. Everyone has to admit that there was the deepest silence in their sermons concerning the righteousness of faith. They only taught about works in the churches. This is why our teachers teach the churches about faith in this way. First, they teach that our works cannot reconcile God to us or merit forgiveness of sins, grace, and justification. We obtain reconciliation only by faith when we believe that we are received into favor for Christ's sake. He alone has been set forth as the mediator and atoning sacrifice, 1 Timothy 2.5, in order that the Father may be reconciled through him. Therefore, whoever believes that he merits grace by works despises the merit and grace of Christ, Galatians 5.4. In so doing, he is seeking a way to God without Christ by human strength, although Christ himself said, I am the way and the truth and the life. This doctrine about faith is presented everywhere by Paul. By grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, Ephesians 2.8. If anyone wants to be tricky and say that we have invented a new interpretation of Paul, this entire matter is supported by the testimony of the fathers. Augustine defends grace and the righteousness of faith in many volumes against the merit of works. Ambrose, in his book The Calling of the Gentiles and Elsewhere, teaches the same thing. In The Calling of the Gentiles, he says, Redemption by Christ's blood would be worth very little, and God's mercy would not surpass man's works, if justification, which is accomplished through grace, were due to prior merits. So justification would not be the free gift from a donor, but the reward due the laborer. Spiritually inexperienced people despise this teaching. However, God-fearing and anxious consciences find by experience that it brings the greatest consolation. Consciences cannot be set at rest through any works, but only by faith, when they take the sure ground that for Christ's sake they have a gracious God. As Paul teaches, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. Romans 5.1 This whole doctrine must be related to the conflict of the terrified conscience. It cannot be understood apart from that conflict. Therefore, inexperienced and irreverent people have poor judgment in this matter because they dream that Christian righteousness is nothing but civil and philosophical righteousness. Until now, consciences were plagued with the doctrine of works. They did not hear consolation from the gospel. Some people were driven by conscience into the desert and into monasteries, hoping to merit grace by a monastic life. Some people came up with other works to merit grace and make satisfaction for sins. That is why the need was so great for teaching and renewing the doctrine of faith in Christ, so that anxious consciences would not be without consolation, but would know that grace, forgiveness of sins, and justification are received by faith in Christ. People are also warned that the term faith does not mean simply a knowledge of history, such as the ungodly and devil have. James 2.19 Rather, it means a faith that believes not merely the history, but also the effect of the history. In other words, it believes this article, the forgiveness of sins. We have grace, righteousness, and forgiveness of sins through Christ. The person who knows that he has a Father who is gracious to him through Christ truly knows God, John 14, 7. He also knows that God cares for him, 1 Peter 5, 7, and he calls upon God, Romans 10, 13. In a word, he is not without God, as are the heathen. For devils and the ungodly are not able to believe this article, the forgiveness of sins. Hence, they hate God as an enemy, Romans 8, 7, and do not call him, Romans 3, 11, 12, and expect no good from him. Augustine also warns his readers about the word faith and teaches that the term is used in the scriptures not for the knowledge that is in the ungodly, but for the confidence that consoles and encourages the terrified mind. Furthermore, we teach that it is necessary to do good works. This does not mean that we merit grace by doing good works, but because it is God's will, Ephesians 2.10.
It is only by faith and nothing else that forgiveness of sins is apprehended. The Holy Spirit is received through faith, hearts are renewed and given new affections, and then they are able to bring forth good works. Ambrose says, Faith is the mother of a good will and doing what is right. Without the Holy Spirit, people are full of ungodly desires. They are too weak to do works that are good in God's sight, John 15.5. Besides, they are the power of the devil, who pushes human beings into various sins, ungodly opinions, and open crimes. We see this in the philosophers, who, although they tried to live an honest life, could not succeed, but were defiled with many open crimes, such as human weakness, without faith and without the Holy Spirit, when governed only by human strength. Therefore, it is easy to see that this doctrine is not to be accused of banning good works. Instead, it is to be commended all the more because it shows how we are enabled to do good works. For without faith, human nature cannot in any way do the works of the first or second commandment. 1 Corinthians 2.14 Without faith, human nature does not call upon God, nor expect anything from him, nor bear the cross. Matthew 16, 24. Instead, human nature seeks and trusts in human help. So when there is no faith and trust in God, all kinds of lusts and human intentions rule them in the heart. Genesis 6, 5. This is why Christ says, apart from me, you can do nothing. John 15, 5. That is why the church sings, lacking your divine favor, there is nothing in man, nothing in him is harmless. We join together in the Apostles' Creed in the Lord's Prayer. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. O Lord, merciful and holy Bridegroom, we grieve the fall of your church. It is our fault that the beauty of your bride is no longer recognized. Therefore, we pray you, give and increase in us faith, love, and hope in you. Root out of us all sins and vice, all strife, all disbelief, all error and heresy. Rebuke the erring, convert the unbelievers. Bring the rebellious again to the unity of the Christian church and show them the light of your truth. Protect our shepherd from all danger of body and soul. Bless all pastors and those who administer in the church in the building of your congregation. Grant them success in all things. Equip your whole church with the power and proof of the holy faith. Stand by your witnesses among the nations and further the course of your gospel in all the world. Fill all government with the fear of you and let their ruling serve to foster and preserve peace. Have mercy on our people and our country. Let the youth be brought up in discipline and in the right knowledge of you, so that they may recognize your law and the way of your salvation. Give constancy and loyalty to all pious teachers. Comfort all the troubled and sorrowful. Impart health of body and soul to the sick. Grant to all pregnant women, according to your mercy, a happy result in their childbearing. To the needy, give bodily and spiritually according to your good pleasure. Let those who travel be commended to the protection of your holy angels. And be a strong help to all who need you. For the sake of your holy wounds, O Jesus. Amen. Christ, our risen Lord, your resurrection showed us what we will someday be and what we already are now through our baptism into your holy name. Give us courage to bear in our bodies your resurrected life as we live out the fruit of your victory over death through works of charity and mercy 
for you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me this day. And I pray that you would forgive me all my sins where I have done wrong, and graciously keep me this night. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good night.